Welcome back. So we're talking about how we can use the singular value decomposition to compute a least squares regression fit for data. Okay, so a linear regression, best fit linear regression model given some uh, data A that should correlate to some output B. Okay, and we walked through a MATLAB example of a simple linear system uh, with one input and one output. Now we're gonna look at some real world data that have multiple input factors A and some output, output factor B. Again, all of the code is at databookuw.com in both MATLAB and Python. Um, here we're going to walk through the MATLAB examples. Okay, And so there's two examples we're going to look at. The first one, um, this is a built-in data set in MATLAB called the Portland Cement data set. So you load hauled, okay? and what hauled has, what this data set has, is essentially it has a set of ingredients, these are kind of multiple ingredients A that your cement mixture could be made out of, and B, the output, is how much heat was generated in the process of mixing, uh, mixing that cement. So as you mix up cement um, and it cures, it generates heat, and so they measured the heat generation given all of these different mixtures uh, of cement. And so what we're going to do is we're going to load this data, and we're going to say that the input factors, if I want to have a, I want to build a model potentially for given a mixture of, of ingredients, what would be the heat generated uh, by those ingredients? So we're going to, uh, to load this data, we're going to compute the SVD of A, and get our best fit slope, um, essentially, of the heat as a function. Uh, so there will be a plane that fits heat as a function of ingredients in a best fit sense. And that's given by the slope x, uh, and then we're going to plot it. Okay, so this one's pretty simple. I just want to show you what it looks like. Um, so this is the data. So there are uh, 13 different kind of mixtures of ingredients. And uh, actually, I should probably show you, um, I believe there are, so I don't know if you can see in the upper right, this A matrix, let's, let's just run the size of A. So the size of A is a 13 by 4 matrix. So what that means is that they did 13 experiments. There are four ingredients you could mix up. Uh, so if I just take A, these are the, the 13 experiments, and those are the mixtures of ingredient one, two, three, and four. So essentially, we have a four-dimensional vector A, uh, or four columns of the matrix A, if you like. And each row is a different experiment where they mixed up that mixture of ingredients and then computed the heat for that mixture of ingredients, and so on and so forth. And so when we plot this, essentially what we're seeing is across all of those 13 experiments, we're seeing the heat generation. I'm assuming, you know, maybe this is in temperature. I don't know what the actual units are. Um, and then what we're seeing is the actual data in white and the regression model in blue. So you can see that from this data, you can build a model that pretty faithfully captures uh, the variations in the different mixtures across, across this data. Now, this is, um, I'm being a little naive here. In reality, you wouldn't use all 13 experiments to build the model and then plot all 13, because that might be overfitting. Um, I might be kind of overfitting the slope of x to this data. And then if I had a 14th experiment, it might be totally different. So in reality, what I might do is I might randomly pull 10 experiments at a time, build a slope x. Pull another 10 experiments at a time, build a slope x, and either average over those slopes or use uh, the remaining th three experiments to see how accurate that slope was on holdout data that I didn't use to train the model. Now, that's some, we'll talk about that much later and in much more detail how to validate your statistical models uh, and not overfit by, by plotting it on top of the training data like I've done here, but it's just a simple uh, illustration. Okay, another data set that I think is really fun is the uh, Boston housing data. Again, this is a built-in one in MATLAB. You just load housing. And then there are a, a few different variables that get loaded. So you have uh, in this, this vector B that I'm going to generate from, from the data T is the, the price of the houses in thousands of dollars. And this must be a pretty old data set because these are like $50,000, $40,000 homes. And I don't think you can buy a home in Boston for, for $50,000 or $40,000 now. Okay, so B is kind of the output. 
and A are all of the factors that might um, factor into a home price. And I don't know uh, what these exact factors are. It would probably be things like um, you know, density of houses per square kilometer, or proximity to an elementary school, or uh, you know, proximity to a freeway, things like that that would affect the home values. Um, so there's a bunch of factors in P that I'm going to rewrite into a matrix A. Uh, and I'm going to do something all else. I'm actually adding in a column of one. So this A matrix has all of these factors that people think are important. And if I only built a regression model on that A, the slope would necessarily, the, the line would go through the origin. So there would be some values where the home price would be zero uh, or even negative. And that's kind of um, fishy in my opinion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a column of ones here to my A matrix, another column of ones. Let's just do that right now. So I have my column of ones. So that essentially what that gives me is a constant offset. It gives me, um, so I have a slope and it's going to allow me to fit an intercept, kind of the, the offset of this distribution, because you can't buy a house for zero dollars. Maybe the kind of minimum or average home price is, I don't know, at this time, 20 or $30,000. So that's what this column is going to allow us to do. OK, good. Now, again, there's a lot of ways of computing this here. I chose to use the regress command. You could absolutely compute the SVD and do pseudo inverse. Um, that's totally fine. You could do P inverse. I'm just going to plot what you have here. Okay, and I'm going to plot two things. What I'm going to plot is um, the true house value and the predicted house value given our model A times X just for all of the houses. And I'm not going to sort them or order them or do anything fancy here in the first subplot. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot that exact same data sorted by home price. Okay, so I want to point out here that these really are tools for analyzing your data. You don't just want to compute the SVD for the sake of computing it. You want to build these linear regression models so that you can understand the factors that uh, drive the outcome. Uh, that, that's what a model is. And in fact, I mean, that really is the basis of all of machine learning. So you have this kind of new uh, energy in machine learning and building models from data. But really, we've been doing this for hundreds of years with these regression models. Okay, So this is what the data looks like. Uh, let's see if I can reshape it a little bit, make it a little flatter. OK, so again, it's, it's a little hard to see because there's so many homes. There's 500 homes. These are their prices. Um, I must have subtracted out. Actually, no, only the blue values dip below zero. Um, the, the white values are all positive home values. So these are, in white, are all the actual home values for the 500 homes. And in blue are my model predictions. It's actually pretty darn good. They're not perfect. There's some blue values that are kind of silly, right? You can't have a negative home value. But when I plot them in a sorted way, when I sort these, these, uh, these values by the home income, so I'm sorting everything by the uh, value of the, the true white dots here, then what you see is that our model prediction in blue is actually doing a very, very good job of capturing this trend. There is statistical variation. There are, you know, there's variation from home to home in the, in the thousands of dollars, but the general trend is, uh, is captured by this regression model. You know, I don't know what the, what the dominant factors are. Maybe it's you know, proximity to a school or density of you know, people per kilometer or something like that. Who knows um, how many shops are around. Depends on what those factors are. Um, but to some extent, we are capturing the right distribution of this model. Okay. Now again, I'm kind of cheating here because I'm using all of the data to train my model and then I'm plotting the model on all of that data. So I could absolutely be overfitting uh, to, to the data here. Okay, good. Uh, what you can also do is you can look at what that vector x, those slopes, actually look like. And what you can do is you can see which, um, which slopes x were the most informative, uh, informative in building this prediction model. So here we have kind of the actual magnitudes of the slopes across each of these 13 factors. So again, if I go back to the size of my data and I say size of A, I have 506 by 14 factors. Okay, So I've got 506 home values. And each of those home values, we measure 14 factors that we're going to try to correlate to those home values. 
And if I plot here, I think I've removed the ones column. This is how, these are the actual slopes or the loadings of each, uh, each of those factors, each of those 13 factors that should factor into the home price. And so you can see that some of these are more important than others. Like factor 10 is a really, really positively correlated with home value. So if you have more of factor 10, your home value goes up. Maybe that's um, proximity to a school or something. If you have, uh, these factors seven and eight are anti-correlated with home price. So if you have more of seven or eight, your home price will actually be lower. Maybe that's something else that, that's not desirable in a home, okay? And so that's kind of interesting. You can actually interpret these slopes uh, of your model. Again, we're gonna talk about this a lot more in a lot more detail uh, in, in later sections and in later chapters of this book. Okay, how to validate these models, how to uh, get more interpretable models using uh, L1 penalized regressions and the lasso, we'll talk about that in chapter three. How to cross validate uh, and make sure you're doing your statistics and your machine learning right, we'll talk about that in chapters four, five, and six. But there is something I wanna, I wanna point out. So I, I do have to show you how to hold out data for testing because you can't just build a model on all of your data, uh, say it looks good and use that model. You have to have some data to test it or validate your model on. So what we're gonna do here is out of my 506 homes where I have data, right, 506, I'm gonna take the first 253 of them and I'm gonna train the model on that 253 and then I'm gonna test the model on the next 253, and we're gonna see how accurate uh, those, those models are. So it's exactly the same thing, except now I've split my data into a training A and B, and a test A and B. And I'm gonna plot these here. Okay, let me just make this a little bigger. So the top row shows uh, the actual home values. Uh, I should probably put legends on this. Um, let me just legend this real quick. Um, the legend is true and model. Oh, no, nope, model and true. Okay. Okay, that's... Not good colors. Okay, good. So red is the model, B is uh, blue is true here. And so what we see is that in the training data, remember I split my data into half that I use for training and half that I use for testing. In the training data, we're actually capturing the trends really, really well. It matches almost perfectly because again, that's how I built X was so that this matched really well. When I apply it to my holdout data that I didn't use to build my model, you see that for some homes, it actually does a great job, but there are other homes where it completely misses uh, the factors that correlate into those home prices, okay? So this is a little uh, worrisome that the data only works sometimes and not others, the model only works sometimes and not others on this testing data, okay? And I would actually see, like as, a, as a, a modeler, when I see something like this, what this tells me is that the time series, kind of the, the index of you know, home one versus home two versus home three, the sampling was not random. They maybe sampled one neighborhood, then another neighborhood, then another neighborhood, and we just don't have any data of this neighborhood in this model, okay? So that might be why that's doing such a poor job. And so we might be able to fix this by instead of just picking the first half to, to train on and the second half to test, if I randomly shuffle all of my data, and then take the first half and the second half, I have a very high likelihood of sampling all of these neighborhoods to build my model. Okay, and that's what we're gonna do next. And so if I use this uh, rand perm uh, command here to shuffle all of my data, so I get a vector of different indices, and I shuffle the B and the A matrices with the same random permutations, um, and I run this code, what you'll see is in principle, this model is doing a lot better job on all of the, the test set. So it's not, it's actually less good on the training data. There's, there's more variability of the model on the training data potentially, but it's doing a more faithful job of capturing uh, these kind of trends in the testing data. Okay, so really important for us to recognize that um, a couple of things, let's recap. If you have data of a bunch of input factors, let's say these 13 factors that might factor into home price, and you have a truth measurement of what that home actually costed, uh, costs or, or was, was sold at, 
then you can build a regression model. You can find kind of the slope of this hyperplane that best fits that data, that best correlates those input factors to that output that you want to uh, that you want to be able to predict in the future. So if you want to predict future home price, you would just measure these uh, these 13 variables. You multiply it by x, and you can get a decent prediction of your home price. But again, you have to be super careful when you build your models. You can't use all of the data to train and to test. That's cheating. So you have to hold some of the data out for validation. And you have to be careful about how you sample your data so that you don't get biases for one neighborhood versus the other. Okay, thank you.